Hundreds of thousands of children at risk of starving to death in the world's newest country. ITV News has an eyewitness account from South Sudan, where civil war has devastated the population. This camp and others like it was designed to offer an emergency place of safety for two or three days. For well, three years on, the temporary has become permanent. Also tonight, Burko, under pressure, calls for the Speaker to resign over his criticism of Donald Trump. A court hears a Marine serving life for murdering an Afghan prisoner was mentally ill. And a mother's 6,000-mile walk of love in memory of her daughter. This is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. Good evening. We start tonight with a heartbreaking account of how hundreds of thousands of children are starving to death in the world's newest country. ITV News has been to South Sudan, where UNICEF is warning urgent action is needed. South Sudan won independence six years ago, but fighting between government and rebel forces is threatening to turn into an all-out ethnic war. And it is civilians who are bearing the brunt of the escalating violence. Five million people face starvation, 362,000 children are severely malnourished. One in ten of them die before their tenth birthday from preventable diseases. Our Africa correspondent John Ray went to a refugee camp near the capital Juba where he heard of horrifying brutality amid the daily struggle for survival. His report contains details you may find distressing. In a short life, he's known only war, disease and hunger. The boy's name is Emmanuel Lucky. His eternal misfortune is to be born in a country hell-bent on self-destruction. So too this baby, swollen belly and emaciated arms. The cleft lip is the least of his ills. Starvation and malaria might finish what the soldiers started. When the fighting began, I ran with my children, his teenage mother tells me. We hid along the riverbank for three days. We had nothing to eat. Now he has fever. In South Sudan, there are many such fragile lives, victims of a vicious ethnic conflict who rely on a modest force of UN troops for protection. Here, they guard this sprawling tent city of 37,000 souls, these people have been told by their government, whose own forces are to blame for much of the bloodshed, that it is safe to go back to their homes. More convincing is the terrifying testimony you hear from those who have just arrived, like Betty, 16 years old, perhaps her family's sole survivor. I'm just here alone. I don't know where's my family. Tell me what happened when the soldiers came. People are dying. If uh, they got lady. They will ref. They will ref even though grandmother or father just they are repping people easily like that. It is not a hard way to be. And you saw this? I saw. I was going with my school teacher. They saw that that teacher because they want to ref me. But I ran from them. Just I I covered myself in another tree like this. That they didn't show me. There are children here who can barely remember life beyond the barbed wire. It is almost as much a prison as a sanctuary. This camp and others like it was designed to offer an emergency place of safety for two or three days. Well, three years on, the temporary has become permanent. So to the fear, the chaos and the hatred that grips this country. Mary Kidia and her children can finally sleep without fear of the men with machetes, she tells me. They would break down our doors in the night and kill the women and children. If they're lucky, the sickest might make it to South Sudan's main children's hospital. But here, staff struggle with too few drugs and too little food, even for the starving. Even in the hospital, children die. We don't say 100% they don't die, they die. They are brought at a terminal stage, 
they die, others die before even touching them. It happens. Rose has already buried three of her children. Her fourth has the same fever, the same hollow eyes. Why will God not spare me this one boy, she asks. But mercy, divine or human, has been absent for so many for so long. A young nation in great agony, the world cannot afford to look away. John Ray, ITV News, South Sudan. On our website, there's more background on the ongoing civil war in South Sudan and how it's causing a growing humanitarian crisis. And you can find that at itv.com forward slash news. Now, President Trump said he would not back down today in his fight against the injunction on his controversial travel ban. He said American lives were at risk and it could go all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, also refusing to back down was the common speaker, John Burko, who's coming under heavy criticism for saying he'd ban Mr Trump from speaking to Parliament. Our deputy political editor, Chris Shipp, has more. Donald Trump walked into the cabinet room of the White House this afternoon, still in fighting mood over his travel ban. Oh, we're going to take it through the system. But the White House has yet to respond to the refusal by the common speaker for the president to speak in the British Parliament. Order. Statement. The Secretary of State for Communities... John Burko's comments yesterday were continuing to overshadow the actual business of the Commons today, a point not lost on the community secretary. I had hoped, Mr Speaker, that this housing white paper would dominate the headlines this morning, but it seems that someone else has beaten me to it. <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as they had the chance, Tory MPs did let the Speaker know just how much they disapproved of his intervention. I do hope, Mr Speaker, that you will help us to ensure <coughs> that we can have full confidence in your impartiality, because that is the way that this House has to proceed. I was honestly and honourably seeking to discharge my responsibilities to the House. I think in the interest of the House, we should move on to other matters. But I think Which was another way of say. saying, please, can we stop talking about it? No... The common speaker must remain politically impartial at all times. Barack Obama including when it comes to deciding which world leaders can and can't address Parliament here in Westminster Hall. At any rate, it should be a matter discussed with the Speaker of the other House, the Lords, but the Lord Speaker made it clear it wasn't. I was not consulted on that decision or its timing. However, the Speaker contacted me this morning. He told me that while he maintained his view on the issue, he was genuinely sorry. And tonight, one MP told us John Burko should resign. I believe that his position is untenable because I believe that the conversation of the last 24 hours has been raised around a political question which was put on the agenda by himself and the Speaker must remain independent. Not many will say that publicly but plenty of MPs are thinking it. Now, you won't be surprised to learn that Tory MPs won't exactly be queuing up to buy John Burko a drink next time they see him in one of the Commons bars. But it's important to stress that he may just have uh, strengthened his position in the House of Commons because his words on Donald Trump have delighted Labour MPs and in particular SNP members. And while many Tories were rather hoping that John Burko would quit the job when he comes to the end of his self-imposed nine-year time limit next summer, Donald Trump may have helped him stay in that job for a little bit longer. OK, Chris Shipp at Westminster, thank you. A Royal Marine serving a life sentence for murdering an insurgent in Afghanistan was mentally ill at the time. The court martial appeal court heard today. Lawyers acting for Sergeant Alexander Blackman say he was a John Wayne character who didn't realise he was unwell. His supporters hope the new evidence will see his conviction quashed. From the court, here's Juliet Bremner. <laughs> A helicopter provides covering fire for British Marines on patrol near an isolated base in Afghanistan. They're hunting for a Taliban fighter who's been targeting them. Sergeant Alexander Blackman, known as Marine A, was in charge that day. What happened next resulted in him being convicted of murder. Images taken from a helmet camera show Blackman shooting the injured man at close range in the chest. The prosecution claim it was a cold-blooded execution, pointing to the following conversation. Hey, I'll shuffle off this mortal call, you 
I think you would do the worst. I know. Exactly. Obviously, this doesn't go anywhere, fellas. Yeah, Roger, mate. I've just broken the Geneva Convention. Yeah, Roger. His wife, Claire, has spent three years gathering evidence to challenge his conviction. Today, psychiatrists told the appeal court her husband was suffering from adjustment disorder when he shot the insurgent. Supporters are convinced that this was a miscarriage of justice, but five senior judges must now be persuaded that Alexander Blackman did have a mental illness, which meant that his ability to make a rational judgment was substantially impaired. His barrister said Mr Blackman's nature is very reserved. He's a sort of John Wayne character, very proud of the Marines' macho image. Fellow Marines who'd packed the court heard that this hid the tremendous stress he'd been under. The appeal will continue tomorrow. Juliet Bremner, ITV News. The UK faces nearly a decade of austerity, a respected think tank warned today. Ahead of next month's budget, the Institute for Fiscal Studies says the Chancellor, Philip Hammond, will have to find an extra £34 billion to achieve his target of eliminating the deficit. The IFS says he will do this through more tax rises or more spending cuts. Now, MPs have been offered a take-it-or-leave-it vote on any final Brexit deal. The Commons and the Lords will be asked to give their approval before it goes to the European Parliament. Our political editor, Robert Peston, joins us from Central Lobby. So, Robert, tell us, how is this actually going to affect Brexit? Well, another day, another Brexit debate here, and the Brexit minister, David Jones, appeared to offer a significant concession by saying that MPs would be offered a vote on the final Brexit deal before the European Parliament gets a vote. Now, that seemed very significant because it looked as though MPs would have the opportunity to influence the final outcome. And if they didn't like the deal, then they could send Theresa May back to Brussels for a better deal. However, that Brexit minister, David Jones, then provided a clarification which showed that although the timing of the vote might be a bit earlier than people had thought would happen, they were still, we are, the people, representatives, MPs, are still going to be offered a take it or leave it. If they don't like what she negotiates, the, the alternative is no deal at all. They didn't like that very much. It was put to a vote and the government almost lost. But in the end, Theresa May scraped through. OK, Robert Peston, thank you. Still to come on the ITV Evening News, tears in the witness box from the man accused of murdering the children's author, Helen Bailey and the bereaved mother who walked around Britain in memory of her five-year-old daughter. Those no stories and more after the break. Join me then. Welcome back. The government today unveiled its blueprint to tackle what it described as England's broken housing market. Proposals include forcing local authorities to put in plans to build more homes or ministers will intervene. It's all designed to help more people release their, realise their dream of home ownership, as our national editor Allegra Stratton reports. And it is just black mould and this is an inside wall. And you've got some Six time. flats in seven years, but for Lou, this one, perhaps the worst of the lot. This we only did recently, you know, a week or so ago. This one may be damp and too small for her children to live with her, but Lou couldn't afford her previous flats. It became unmanageable for me when I was paying £1,200 a month rent for a flat, a two-bedroom flat, with me and my two children in, and my daughter had to sleep in bed with me. I could not afford anything else, and eventually I lost that flat. Britain's housing market is broken, the government acknowledged today. Home ownership, they said, is a distant dream. Ministers announced steps to protect the 11 million in rented accommodation from unscrupulous landlords. But there was also action to build more houses. The government has a target of a million new homes by 2020. It says at least 250,000 houses are needed each year to keep pace with demand. The new proposals force councils to build thousands more homes in city centre sites. From next April, a lifetime ISA will help buyers save for a deposit. And there's also a £3 billion home building fund to help small firms, including factories like this one in the West Midlands. 
The key to this is off-site manufacture. We can manufacture one of these houses in a day in the factory, and as we've discussed, we could build them in a day, significantly quicker than traditional construction. Councils now face a new intervention by central government if enough houses aren't built in their area. To do this, they said today they needed new borrowing powers. The councils aren't sitting on piles of cash to build houses. What we need to do is actually borrow against our housing stock already um, so that we can actually fund new houses. Another government, another action plan on housing. But while homes may now be made in a day, it's going to take a lot longer to fix the housing market. Allegra Stratton, ITV News. A man accused of murdering the children's author, Helen Bailey, for her money, broke down on the witness stand today, saying he had never stopped loving her. Ian Stewart said he was not responsible for killing his fiancée, whose body was found alongside her dog in a cesspit below their home last year. Richard Pallo reports. We worked so well as a couple, Ian Stewart's description of his relationship with Helen Bailey, who he's accused of murdering to acquire her money. Speaking at the trial for the first time, he says he has no knowledge of how the children's author disappeared along with her beloved dog, Boris. The bodies were found buried under the house they all lived in, three months after going missing. The pair had met on a bereavement website after their previous partners passed away. The defendant described to his barrister, Simon Russell Flint, how he had fallen in love just months after that initial online conversation. He was asked in court, did you ever stop loving Helen? Ian Stewart replied, no. It's going to be put to you that you killed her. No way, he said. Ian Stewart only gave evidence for a little over an hour or so, but in that time he welled up repeatedly, being on the verge of tears, his voice croaking as he described the early stages of his relationship with Miss Bailey. The 56-year-old had helped organise the search for his fiancée last year and admits he was very different to her former husband, who he described as sophisticated, smooth and suave, while he said he was most definitely not. Stewart denies drugging her over a period of time and dumping her in a hidden cesspit under their garage. All the time, Miss Bailey's family watching him intently as he took to the stand. Richard Palo, ITV News, St Albans Crown Court. A teenager who killed an American tourist and injured five others in a knife attack in London's Russell Square has been given an indefinite hospital order. Zachariah Bullhan stabbed mother of two, Darlene Horton, with a kitchen knife and then skipped away with what witnesses described as a crazed smile on his face. He had admitted manslaughter by diminished responsibility. Surrey County Council has abandoned plans to increase council tax by 15% to pay for social care. It would have had to be passed by a referendum. The council now says it will go up by around 5% instead. And Aldi has become the fifth biggest supermarket in the UK, overtaking the co-op. That's according to latest market research figures. 70 new Aldi stores are set to open this year to keep up with customer demand. And finally tonight, a mother's remarkable journey in memory of her five-year-old daughter. Natalia Spencer's walk of love took her 6,000 miles around the coast of Britain, leaving footprints for her daughter Elizabeth. Natalia started and ended at Durdle Door in Dorset, the last seaside place they'd visited before Elizabeth died. Our correspondent Rupert Evelyn was there to meet her. The journey she wished she'd never had to make is at an end. Natalia Spencer's remarkable achievement was born out of a mother's love and loss. Her five-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, loved the seaside, and Natalia's memory of their time together at Durdle Door was the reason she chose to begin and end her walk here. A lot of people have walked around across the line, and uh, obviously it is a very physically very exhausting to walk every day, 20 miles, but if you add to that a massive bag of grief on your shoulders, it makes things much harder. Only people who've kind of walked in your shoes understand that the grief is a journey, isn't it? Grief is a lifetime journey. I didn't expect it to finish in a year, and neither I expect it to finish until the rest of my life. Elizabeth fell ill in December 2015. What initially looked like a chest infection developed quickly into a rare condition that fatally attacked her immune system. Weeks later, driven by the need to do something, Natalia set off on a fundraising walk from Dorset. From there, she walked to Plymouth, Cardiff, John O'Groats in Scotland, Scarborough, 
and back to Dorset, covering 20 miles a day. The route has taken around 6,000 miles of coastline and helped to raise more than £100,000 for charity. In atrocious conditions last night, we found Natalia plodding on. Every day has been a challenge to overcome. It's all for her. It's all for her. Can't say more. This trip is finished, but her journey, you sense, is ongoing. Rupert Evelyn, ITV News, Dorset. Natalia Spencer's remarkable and touching tribute to her daughter, Elizabeth. And that's all for now. Tom Bradby's here with News at 10, but from me and all the team, have a great evening. Bye-bye.